Hello and welcome to Beyond Japan, an interdisciplinary podcast that looks at the broad reach of Japanese studies from within and beyond Japan. This podcast is brought to you by the Center for Japanese Studies at the Sainsbury Institute for the Study of Japanese Arts and Cultures, in collaboration with the University of East Anglia. I'm your host, Oliver Moxham, Project Support Officer at the Sainsbury Institute and Researcher of Japanese War Heritage. This week we are joined by Dr. Ian Rapley, History Lecturer at Cardiff University, exploring the transnational invented language of Esperanto, its legacy in Japan, and the alternative historical perspective it provides us. We apologize once more for the poor audio quality caused by unresolved technical difficulties we aim to resolve for next week's recording. We hope you enjoy the show. Good morning, Ian. Thank you for joining us on the show today. Uh, first of all, we'd like to know a bit more about you. Uh, can you tell us about your fields and how your interests have brought you there? Yeah, so um, my name's Ian Rapley, and I am a lecturer in the history department at Cardiff University. And I teach Japanese history as my specialism, but obviously a, a range of other things um, to the undergraduates. My research, again, it's a sort of a bit of a mishmash at the moment, but generally it's, it's topics on, on modern Japan. So typically the 20th century, but also a bit of 19th century. Um, broadly linked, I think, under the idea of sort of transnational movements. So anything really that crosses borders uh, typically interests me. And I don't really think I've got a good explanation of how I, I got here. Um, my first exposure to Japan was at, uh, um, at university as an undergraduate as a part-time language course. And from there, I then I did a di- one of the Daiwa Anglo-Japanese scholarships. Um, my specialism was, was maths. And I was interested in artificial intelligence and, and the theory of computer science, that sort of neck of the woods. So that's what I did uh, while I was out in Japan. Um, but when I got back, I then went into the city of London for a few years. And there um, I worked on both sort of some of the more mathematical sides of things. But, but increasingly, the Japanese angle came to the fore as well. And so that sort of interest in Japan sort of came out there, working on some Japanese corporations and, and things like that. And then ultimately, it became clear that I wasn't really suited to working in finance, I think. And so I went back to uni to do a, first an MPhil and then a, a DPhil in Japanese studies. I think I originally intended to, to branch off the work I'd done in, in finance and look at Japanese mergers and acquisitions. But in the end, I've ended up as a historian. So like I say, it's, it's possible to sort of flag a few things that sort of put a through line through things. So, for example, I currently work on language. And I, I spent some time in a, in a lab on computational linguistics while I was in, on the Diver Scholarship. But really, I think it's more of a series of happy accidents than anything else. Yeah, very interesting uh, way of approaching it. Um, so in your research of transnational language, you have largely focused on Esperanto, uh, a language invented by a Polish ophthalmologist in 1887 to become an easily learned universal second language. Can you, can you briefly share the history of Esperanto with us and how it, what, how it arrived and was received in Japan? Yeah, so Esperanto is part of a rich tradition of language invention or language planning um, that goes back certainly at least until the Enlightenment. Nowadays, when we think about invented or planned languages, we talk about, we, we tend to, the most common example is things that emerge in films or science fiction. So, for example, the classic case always used to be Klingon, but I think nowadays it's more Dothraki from uh, Game of Thrones. But in the 19th century, the, the paradigmatic in planned language was what's called international languages or, or indeed international auxiliary languages. And as you say, the idea of these was to facilitate international communication. The auxiliary means that these languages weren't designed to replace everyone's native language. They were designed, as you say, to be a a, a universal second language. And the idea was that by coming up with a language that was easy to learn, a simple grammar, followed regular rules rather than sort of the accidents of uh, natural languages, it would be much easier to learn. And also it would be uh, neutral. It wouldn't favour any one country. So, for example, if French was the language of diplomacy, then that was of obvious advantage to the French, but also to to European nations over other nations who had less experience or less sort of uh, less depth in in speaking French. And Esperanto is, is the one that's come down to us through history as the most successful. 
but it was only one of a number of, of these projects that were that were proposed and uh, published and so on. It was popular in Japan. I mean, it still is popular in its own way in Japan, but it, it, it did what was accepted in Japan. It, it arrived in Japan sort of in the wake of the Russo-Japanese War at the start of the 20th century. Um, now, it might seem a bit esoteric to think about, to research this 19th century language experiment and its impact on Japan. But really, it's a route into thinking about ideas of internationalism and transnationalism in relation to language. So I think really there are two things I'm interested in. One of them is to argue that there's an international dimension to our to the historiography of language in modern Japan. And then the second is to argue, conversely, if that's putting the international into language, it's to put the language into internationalism. And that's to argue that there's a linguistic dimension to all transnational or international activity. So just to sort of think about the first one, Japan's modernity is essentially tied up with it's opening up to wider contacts of the world and in particular to the Western nations. And the, the historiography of language in, in modern Japan has focused very much on, on Genbunichi, that sort of the unification and standardization of spoken and written language as a part of a nation building project, the unification of Japan as a, as a, as a single coherent nation and a, a nation state. But one of the things that I've, Sort of uncovered and argue and i think that is reason new and i think personally exciting is that there's an international dimension too to that language history in the sort of late 19th and early 20th century so just as japan's modernity and modernizing is about national unification and the creation of a nation state it's also about learning new ways of contacting and connecting with other countries um, and so that involves language as well. And, and we see just as the debates that are going on about Genbunichi, about the standardization of language um, in places like the Meirokuzashi and, and the debates amongst intellectuals, there's also debates going on and activities going on about communicating beyond Japan's borders. So perhaps the most famous um, of, the, of the linguistic proposals of the, of the early Meiji period is that of Mori Arinori's so-called English pro proposal. And quite what he was proposing is very, very ambiguous. Um, and it's, it's much debated, but broadly speaking, he was arguing for a greater position of English in, um, in, the, Jap in, in the Japanese spoken languages. Now, that again has been looked at, it's sometimes called a sort of replacing Japanese with English or, or various things, but it's been looked at in this domestic language paradigm. But I think it's clear from reading what he has to say that he's thinking also about projecting beyond Japan's borders and talking to other nations about trade, about diplomacy and so on. So there, in, in perhaps at the very heart of the historiography of the Japanese language in, in the modern era, at any rate, there's an international dimension. But there are also other examples. So there's also some research been done on what's called the Yokohama Ports Lingo or um, Yokohama Kotoba, which is a sort of pigeon that emerges in Yokohama and the other treaty ports to facilitate sort of day to day activity. And that represents, you know, a very different type of language to a sort of intellectual proposal, intellectual sort of experiment. But nevertheless, it's a practical language for getting everything, getting things done. Um, and then, of course, there's there's Esperanto. But even before Esperanto, one of Esperanto's predecessors, a language called Volapuk, which is almost completely forgotten now, had, a, had a, an exposure in Japan where it was introduced, there was a series of articles on it and a, a minor course run in one of the major newspapers. Um, it never really took off, but nevertheless, we can see an interest in Japan in ideas about facilitating easier communication overseas. So when we get to Esperanto in, 19, in, the, in the early 20th century, in the 1900s, we can see it as sort of, as a part of this tradition of international language, of thinking about how to more easily communicate with people beyond the Japanese border, beyond the Japanese linguistic borders. Perhaps even, even if we think about the Romaji movement, the idea of replacing um, Japanese characters with, with the Latin alphabet, that could be seen as, a, as both a domestic aspect, it, it's about reform to the Japanese language, but it has a, an international dimension because it, it would form a sort of almost a link between the Japanese language and then other languages, Western European languages in particular. 
So would you say that this transnational approach to history through language is a means of disrupting national narratives of, of history? Yes and no. Um, one of the things that, that you can say about the, the uh, transnational movements is if we talk about them as sort of border crossing, it, propo- it sort of um, it presupposes almost a border to cross. So it can be um, it can be disruptive, but it can also make us recognise that those sort of those borders exist and therefore sort of segregation, you know, the segregation exists. So it can be sort of um, it can uh, it can support ideas of the nation as well as it can disrupt them. So, for example, one of the leading Esperantists in the early early 20th century, and in fact, the sort of the, 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 the leader of the first generation of Japanese Esperantists is a man named Kuroita Katsumi. He was a historian or a, a literature scholar at the Imperial University, and he's best known for as, as the sort of sponsor of a series of national histories, which um, which is deemed to be very conservative in nature. And he saw Esperanto as a sort of bulwark to incursions of other languages into the Japanese. And so, for example, that it would serve to prevent the creeping introduction of English into Japan. So, so that was less deemed, so for him, it was less disruptive. Now for other people, it was, it was much more disruptive. So going on from this, Esperanto is often described as a cosmopolitan language, an ideology of universalism and world peace. You write that it was well received in rural Japan, used by the residents of Aomori to move away from their local identities and break away from nationalist policies of modernization. Uh, could you expand on the political agency that Esperanto afforded to the dis- disenfranchised communities? Yeah, so Aomori is, is a nice case study because in the sort of early 20th century into the 1920s, there's a discourse and there's a decent body of scholarship on the ways in which Tohoku was conceptualized as a region and also that it was marked as backward, as less modern than other places, particularly obviously Tokyo. And there were a variety of sort of projects aimed to try and rectify this or try and understand it. And one group of young students and and others based in Tohoku, based in Aomori, came up with their own movement to try and to sort of rectify this. And Esperanto was a part of it. And it was explicitly a movement to try and escape this sort of national paradigm that sort of boxed them into a discourse of being backward. So by making a call to the, the global, in essence, they, uh, they were looking to try and sort of sidestep this national sort of context that placed them as laggards in this process of modernization. It wasn't universally accepted. There were others who explicitly looked more to tradition as, as a means of sort of re-engaging local culture. But it was one. And, and it was only one part of what, one example in Tohoku of use of Esperanto in this. So, for example, Miyazawa Kenji, the, the children's author, is another figure from, from another part of Tohoku who looked to Esperanto as part of his projects on a sort of local, regional um, basis. He had a sort of famous small scale agrarian project to try and sort of reinvigorate local culture. And he too engaged uh, Esperanto there. Um, and I think generally you can see them as, as making use of the global to slightly, you might say, provincialize or slightly sort of downplay the role of the nation and the national level in these sort of contested sort of identities between re- locality, region, nation, and then of course global. Elsewhere, um, Esperanto was in, engaged by in, in Okinawa by some of the um, figures tied to uh, movements for sort of Ryukyu culture in a, in a similar sort of period. There, it was a little bit more explicitly Marxist in nature. But in general, anywhere people are seeking to engage beyond the nation, as I said in, in the second, my second sort of dimension to this, anytime you try and engage beyond the nation or beyond your linguistic boundaries, you have to find a common language. Anytime you try and make contact overseas, you have to find a common language with your in, the people you're making contact with. And so in all sorts of different places in Japan, people who were looking in all sorts of different endeavors, science, religion, socialists, um, et cetera, et cetera, whenever the, these people are looking to, looking to make contact abroad, they're finding language problems of, of one form or another. And for many of them, by no means all, of course, Esperanto becomes one possibility to, to maybe find that mutual language to bridge the gap. 
So another thing that I've, I'm interested in is patterns of, of letter writing, because even as early as 1920s, even potentially earlier, if you were interested in making contact overseas, you could put an advert in a magazine, an Esperanto magazine, and, and get pen pal relationships. Now, they are obviously relatively simple relationships, but they turn out to give rise to, to networks of correspondence that stretch across the globe and in many cases last lifetimes. People writing letters to, to people in tens of different countries um, and they're coming from all parts of Japan. So, you know, these villages in Aomori, these villages in other parts of the country that we tend to think of as somehow backward, often they've been characterised as sort of sites of conservative sort of ideologies. Nevertheless, we can find people in, in almost all, you know, all parts of Japan engaging in these networks of, of, of uh, letter writing and so on and, and other forms of engagement overseas through Esperanto and potentially other languages. The time period you focus on in your research is around the 1920s, uh, which covers the Taisho era and the beginning of the Showa era. This period in Japan marks the end of an enthusiastic embracing of Western technologies and ideologies seen in the Meiji era towards a withdrawal from the international community as policies of isolationism, militarism and aggressive expansionism come to the fore. Uh, how does this reconcile with the embrace of Esperanto and the popular internationalism you refer to in pre-war Japan? It, it's um, it's a contested movement and it's not uniform. So there, there's, you know, it, it's, it's diverse. There are people who find Esperanto a threat. There are people who find Esperanto um, a means of opening up doorways. So the 1920s, for example, is not one that even the Japanese government finds itself in a sort of a uniform position on. So, for example... In the early 90s, well, in the, in the 19, 1910s into the 1920s, one of the most famous figures in Japan associated with Esperanto is a man by the name of Vasily Eroshenko, who's a, a blind Ukrainian who arrived in Japan in the, in the early Taisho period. Um, he came to study uh, massage and um, acupuncture because um, he'd heard that that was um, a, a form of profession that the, the, the blind in Japan specialized in so he came to japan he was an esperantist um he was quite progressive uh associated with with lots of different groups but but often including socialists um and he was seen as somewhat of a problematic figure by the state into the early 1920s so eventually he was thrown out of the country for his associations with socialists but at the same time as he was um a portrait of him that was painted by one of his artistic friends was held up as one of the great achievements of sort of Western style art in Japan. So it was celebrated in domestic exhibitions and it was then sent abroad to Paris to, to stand in, in an artistic exchange. And, and in Paris, too, it was celebrated as a great achievement of art. But although this portrait of Vereshenko was held as this, this great cultural achievement, the man himself was deemed despite being blind, too subversive a figure to be allowed into the country. So he was, he was expelled from the country. He ended up going to China for a few years before returning to the then Soviet Union. So the domestic state was, was concerned about many Esperantists' ties to the socialist movement. And indeed, there's a debate that emerges as to whether Esperanto is innately revolutionary in its, um, in its relationship or, or not. And there, there are people arguing on both sides. But at the same time as this is taking place, at the League of Nations, there are debates circling around language and touching on Esperanto, at which Japan ends up as a supporter of Esperanto at the League. So, for example, figures such as Nitabe Inazo and Yanagita Kunio, both Japanese um, actors at the League of Nations, are at the heart of the, these debates and at the heart of these proposals to, if not adopt Esperanto as a language of the League, nevertheless, to use the League to facilitate Esperanto. Um, so you can see there's a few things going on there. One, this is more than just a sort of diffusionist spread of a Western idea to Japan. The Japanese participants of the League of Nations are participating in, in the debates about the role of language at the League of Nations, the role of language in diplomacy. It's also an example of the way language problems emerge not only in sort of small scale places, but always also at the heart of the state in its diplomatic activities. Yanagita Kunio was one example of someone who found language problems in getting his, um, in doing his work at the League of Nations. 
Nitabe Inazo, perhaps a different example, he was, he was famously very multilingual. And so he, he was uh, more successful. But if you, if you look into the experiences of some of the participants in these early years of the league, league, they often talk about the struggles they have with language. But as I say, also, it shows that, that different wings of the state are having very different reactions to Esperanto. And, uh, and, and therefore, as I say, it's sort of, it's not, I, I would hesitate to say contradictory, but it's, it's definitely not uniform, the, re the response to these language issues and the role of Esperanto. Mm. So it definitely shows the fractured nature of politics at, at the time then. Yeah. Yeah, so with this time period that we're looking at, uh, we already can see uh, an, a greatly expanded Japanese empire with uh, territories in Hokkaido, Okinawa, Korea, Taiwan, and numerous, numerous German colonies acquired during the First World War. Uh, was there any move to use Esperanto within Japan and its empire as a lingua franca, or was it, was its inherent universalist ideology incompatible with these imperial ambitions? No, it wasn't incompatible. Um, one, of, one, of the, one of the key points is that the Japanese empire is no less an international endeavor than, than any other. And indeed, Jessamine Abel's work on internationalism stresses that we have to be careful in our assumptions that internationalism as a sort of concept is innately progressive. And she demonstrates a variety of different ways that, um, that internationalism persisted even into the 1930s and the expansion of the Japanese empire. And indeed argues that the Japanese empire was a, a, a regionalist movement and therefore Im embeds in within it ideas about internationalism has a discourse of international cooperation embedded within it, even as we know that it had, you know, was, was predicated upon on violence and uh, expansionism. And so there's, there's language issues playing out there. There are language problems in the Japanese empire, no less than there are in other forms of international activity. Um, they are both practical, i.e., you know, what language can these diverse communities use together um, within the Japanese empire, but also they're sort of, the, the Japanese language becomes has, has a role in signifying the role of the Japanese um, state and, and also the Japanese superiority within the empire. So it, it, it's complicated. One way of thinking about it is to sort of say that the Jap Japanese itself became an international language. So although the, 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 the analytical concept we use to talk about is kokugo, national language, it is mm. kokugo within an international context. It, it's Jap Japanese as an international language. And that sort of may, means that in some respects, Japanese was um, the, the language of the empire, was the international language of the empire. But Esperanto features two, and we see Esperanto being used as, as both language model and perhaps also metaphor for ideas of, of language problems within the Japanese empire. So there are people who propose the use of Esperanto within the Japanese empire. There are others who ex argue for the creation of a, an, a, an Asian Esperanto. So to use the, the Esperanto model, but to devise something that is more explicitly uh, Asian. One example of that is some people propose that Esperanto might split into two, into sort of Western Esperanto and Asian Esperanto, where Asian Esperanto would drop some ideas such as um, the use of the definite article and, and sort of other simple things in which Japanese um, is different to Western language, so word order and things like that. Um, but you also see proposals for the creation of universal scripts for use across the Japanese empire um, uh, and other forms, um, other linguistic experiments that are perhaps not directly tied to Esperanto so much are the idea of a creation of a, a simplified form of Japanese for use in the empire. So that, that's based on ideas of basic English, i.e. restricted grammar, restricted uh, vocabulary to make them a simpler language. And there are proposals for language reform there um, within the Japanese empire. So as I say, linguist, language problems emerge any time you have, sorry, international language problems rather, emerge any time you have international activity. And the, and the empire is no less of an example than that. Um, the other way people seek to use Esperanto is in the wake of um, 1937 and the expansion of war with China, there's a propaganda war that takes place. And one of the arguments that, that um, some, some of the Japanese make is that the reason that Japan's activities are being received so badly overseas is that the Chinese are much more adept at foreign languages than the Japanese and therefore 
are doing a better job of propaganda and explaining what's going on in the continent to um, Europeans and Americans. And that Esperanto might form one network that Japanese Esperantists can use to try and fight back against that by explaining the Japanese position more convincingly than, than they have hitherto been able to. Fascinating. And I suppose it's worth thinking about, so you mentioned earlier how Esperanto was made as uh, an easy language to learn and not to favour any particular country, but it certainly draws strongly upon European languages. Um, was this never seen as an unintended bias in the language in Asia? Yeah, that, that's definitely something which comes up. And as I say, in, that, in, in the sort of the, the late 20s and early 30s, that's something that people talk about. And they say that perhaps a truer international language would draw on more Asian, Asian ideas, or indeed that you need sort of two um, international languages. One critique of uh, Esperanto is it's not a true world language. It's still an, an Occidental language. It's sort of called it, um, the, the, the proposal for Occidental and Oriental as two international languages. Conversely, though, some figures argue that the very fact that it is biased towards um, Europeans means that Japan can be a leader in the movement to spread Esperanto worldwide. So the argument is that if even Japanese people think it's a much easier language to learn, an advantageous addition to international relations, then that's a powerful selling point for other parts of the world. That, you know, if it's just European countries adopting Esperanto, then it will always remain a, a European phenomenon. But if the Japanese can can really get their movement up and, and running, they can be a leader in promoting it worldwide. So that's sort of making a almost making a positive out of that negative, that 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 skew. Very interesting. Uh, so as we know, Esperanto is is far from extinct with speakers across 100 nations, uh, 2000 native speakers and approximately 100,000 people using the language on a regular basis today. And East Asia remains one of the more active regions of the, of the language. But what legacy has it left in Japan today? And finally, um, can you tell us a bit more about what, what you'll be exploring in future projects too? Yeah, so the initial, the, the major difference between Esperanto post-1945 and pre-1945 is a difference of emphasis, where pre-1945, the idea was that Esperanto would be adopted universally. Everyone would learn it at school, and therefore it would have this sort of universal spread. That, that's the vision of an international auxiliary language. And up to 19, in the pre-war period, pre-World War II period, that's what people were really working towards. And that's, that's what their vision was. Now, post-1945, no doubt most Esperantists still retained the hope that that might come to pass. But it became clearer that it wasn't really happening. And there was instead an emphasis on... on a sort of glass half full attitude of saying, well, maybe the, the universal adoption is not going to take place, but we have created a network of Esperantists that's worldwide and we can make use of that, even if universal adoption isn't going to take place. And it represents a shift for, away from the more sort of political, more sort of ideological versions, versions or these visions of universal adoption and more towards it as a personal language, as something that you can have fun with. Right. So those those networks of correspondence continue. But as international travel becomes cheaper and more, more easy to happen, you can go abroad and you can make use of the language by meeting people, by making friends. It becomes a sort of an early, an early phenomenon that comes that sort of we see in sort of things like couch surfing, right? That the Esperanto tourism becomes a major way in which Esperanto is manifested. I.e., when you go abroad, you can hook into networks of Esperantists in the country you visit, and that, that will give you sort of people people to meet and they will sort of introduce you to the local country. Um, so it's a sort of shift away from this vision of universal adoption to one more of, of enjoyment and fun and so on. And for some people that there's a sort of bit of a sense of sadness about that, but for others, it, it enlivens the language in new ways. In, in Japan, Japan remains one of the major countries for Esperanto. As I say, it's, it's a, a relatively small activity and it's one that much like the rest of the country has a sort of aging demographic but it's, it's still there. And it tends to be tied to various other forms of progressive movement. So for example, in the 1970s, we see it tied to ideas of protest against the Vietnam War and so on. 
So it's it's still present in Japan. It just sort of transformed. Obviously, the Internet, too, has, has changed the ways in which people interact internationally. And therefore, Esperanto has a, has a large web presence as well. As for what I am um, moving on to work on, too, there's a variety of different things. But but um, one one of that one element within that one project I want to move on to is some work on the history of science in Japan and some of its tri transnational dimensions. And actually, as I started getting dug, digging into that, I discovered there's a language dimension to that as well. So as I said, you know, any international endeavor in, has problems of international language and finding mutual languages to, to communicate in. And so the Japanese scientists have hit language problems of their own. So indeed, perhaps the first Japanese Esperantist of all is a man by the name of Oka Asajiro, who's a famous biologist and, and tied to the introduction of ideas of Darwinian selection into, into Japan. He was um, he uh, real polylingual. The story goes that he in, first encountered Esperanto whilst in a bookshop in Germany looking for a textbook on Swedish, for example. <laughs> so, you know, he had engaged, he, he learned many, many European languages. He was interested in, in Volapuk, that, that Esperanto predecessor I mentioned. He learned Esperanto, he even invented his own planned language that was very much along a, a model along Esperanto's lines, but brought in some Japanese elements as well. Medicine is a good example, again, and I know, I think, I think it's well known that Japanese medicine and Japanese medical education is tied strongly to, to German. So even when I was first in Japan, it was sort of advised me that if I had to go to the doctors and my Japanese wasn't quite up to scratch, then I could try using German. Now, my German is significantly worse than my <laughs> Japanese, so it wouldn't have really helped. But nevertheless, we can sort of see patterns of education being tied into to, to languages. And so there are, there's, a, there's a strong Esperanto movement within science in the pre-war period. Indeed, meteorology, for some reason, ends up with a, with a quite a high uptake of Esperanto, to the point that another Japanese scientist, a man called Oishi Wasaburo, published some findings of his in Esperanto. He, he was the first scientist to observe the jet stream, that sort of high wind speeds at that high altitude. And in order to try and publish his discovery more widely, he wrote up his report in, in Esperanto. As it happens, it didn't get the uptake he was looking for. And for a long time, the discovery of the jet stream was tied more to World War II and scientists in the wake of World War II. But it just sort of shows that for all, you know, that science is a transnational activity and therefore identifying a language that can be used to communicate your scientific findings is a problem. And the more you are at the peripheries of these endeavours, the more that language barrier becomes an issue. Do you write your, your findings up in your own language or do you learn German or now, I suppose, English and publish in English, in which case you're more likely to be read more widely, but it, it puts barriers up to who can participate in language and so on. So, you know, as I move on to a new topic, I discovered that actually some of these older issues, some of these prior issues that I've looked at are, are present there all the same. Yeah, and it def definitely endures. I think it's still very much an issue in uh, Japanese academia today of uh, engaging with global academia. You, you need to, to engage through English, and that's uh, <laughs> certainly shaping how global knowledge is forming. Yeah, thank you for joining us again today. It's been very insightful learning about a whole new way of looking at history and challenging old conceptions. Thank you for joining us. Oh, thank you. You can find the link to Ian's research profile in the description below. Next week, we will be joined by Eric Brunner, Professor of Social and Biological Epidemiology at the University College London to discuss health and inequality in post-growth Japan. We hope you'll join us then. Thank you for listening.